Uh, our next speaker is uh, Nicole Judd Beckham. Uh, Nicole is a second year uh, a master's in human rights uh, uh, degree program student. Uh, she is also the associate director of the Center on Rights Development, so she's one of my minion. I <laughs> so I thought that happened. So, so I, was, I couldn't resist that. So I'm not, um, Nicole, I mean, uh, Nicole. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. That was a great introduction, Yvonne. Um, and I'll pretty much just read from here because it'll help me stay focused. And it is just right on the dot of 10 minutes. So uh, before I start, I definitely want to say that my views do not represent the Center of uh, the Center on Rights Development <laughs> or the Occupy movement more broadly. I've been invited here to participate in this panel to share my personal reasons for uh, participating in Occupy marches down in Denver. Uh, so I have only 10 minutes. I'll try to explain what I see as a number of serious problems in this country, and while doing so, also address some of the criticisms that I've heard lately about the movement. So whether in Tunis, Cairo, Madrid, Athens, New York, or Denver, the recent uprisings that we've been seeing around the world are a reaction to the unequal concentration of power in the hands of a small minority who use wealth as a tool to oppress, disenfranchise, and maintain control over the majority. Here in the United States, this manifests itself in the legalization of corporate dominance and the impunity for corporate abuse. U.S. policy over the past 30 years has encouraged extreme deregulation of the economy under the belief that without government interference, capital will flow unimpeded in a so-called free market, leading to economic growth and therefore human progress. Yet in actuality, corporations are able to cherry pick which types of government interference either suit them or not. And what we really end up getting is a very substantial amount of corporate welfare at the expense of American citizens. For example, corporations are given a seat at the legislative table so that they can literally sit down with our representatives in Washington and draft model bills on a range of policy issues from health care to the environment. We see this in the American Legislative Exe Exchange Council, or ALEC, which, uh, where some of the largest companies in America enjoy a form of direct democracy that we as citizens are not privy to. Companies such as AT&T, Pfizer, Walmart, Coca-Cola, State Farm Insurance, and Koch Industries then provide the funding to particular candidates so they can get those bills passed. Not only do corporations enjoy the legal status of personhood, they were granted the First Amendment right of free speech in 2010, allowing unlimited financial contributions to U.S. political campaigns. In other words, they can buy candidates. We also see purchasing influence in our police departments, such as when J.P. Morgan Chase invested $4.6 million in the New York City Police Foundation. We can then look at the most blatant example of corporate welfare and the 2008 bank bailout. After seeing how a systematic lack of oversight created banks that were too big to fail, 200 billion taxpayer dollars were loaned away with the same mentality that got us into the mess in the first place. There's been painfully little oversight, no stipulations to promote lending after payback, and not even an attempt to charge interest. Hell, we as students don't even get that kind of deal, do we? But then again, we, unlike the gods on Wall Street, are unable to purchase a vote or a voice up on Capitol Hill. As if exorbitant bonuses weren't insult enough, these corporate executives who are responsible for committing white-collar fraud have enjoyed blanket amnesty for their crimes. Economist and former financial regulator William Black points out that during the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s, financial regulators made over 10,000 criminal referrals to the FBI, resulting in more than 1,000 FBI agents conducting investigations. In the current subprime lending crisis, financial regulators have made zero criminal referrals, despite the fact that losses have been 70 times larger than that of the savings and loan crisis. What is referred to in the Occupy movement as the top 1% is not only a list of CEOs, but a group of corporate political elites who have swindled for themselves an unequal distribution of income, not by accident, but by the deliberate manipulation of our democratic system. With that said, is it that surprising that Americans are upset? Another major aspect of neoliberalism encourages the reduction in public expenditure for social services in exchange for privatization. It is believed that government should not, need not attempt to level disparities in the economic playing field, 
because the so-called free market will generate enough capital at the top to trickle down to those below. From a human rights perspective, this outlook is deeply troubling. It removes the onus of responsibility from the state as the sole duty bearer of human rights, and it concedes a great amount of power to corporate entities without bestowing any accountability for upholding a minimum of quality of life when the trickle-down system inevitably fails. Furthermore, after having created the conditions of limited opportunity, the 1% then engages in a practice of blaming the victim. As the poor grow poorer and the middle class disappears, we blame ourselves and each other for being lazy, asking for handouts, and not working hard enough. Unfortunately, this same rhetoric is repeated to discredit the Occupy movement. From pundits in the mainstream media to graduate students here at Corbell, I hear jokes about how the occupiers are a bunch of bums who should stop complaining and go get a job. But for those doling out criticism, I encourage you to come down to one of the Occupy marches. You'll see for yourself that participants include teachers, arguably the most important professionals in our society, who now earn 375 times less than your average CEO on the S&P 500. There are young people who carry the burden of over $1 trillion in collective student debt, yet whose chances of paying back that debt are challenged by a dismal job market. There will be hundreds of hardworking families who have lost their homes or jobs, but who occupy for the sake of their children's future. Occupied cities across America are supported by seniors who have worked their entire lives only to face an eviscerated social security program and the subsequent need to continue working long into their 60s and 70s. Veterans, like Ron, returning from war, who make up a very large portion of the protesters, are learning the hard way that they do not have the social support that has been pledged by many a good bumper sticker. There's also the support of indigenous people who have suffered the consequences of untamed greed in this country for centuries. Yes, there are homeless people, there are poor people, there are those who have battled and who are still battling chemical dependency and substance abuse. They are part of this movement. There's absolutely no reason to discount the Occupy movement because of this. What makes them any less qualified to cry foul about the state of our nation? The structures needed to create a healthy, productive society have been diminished, and income inequality grows, and social mo mobility remains stagnant. The poor have been hit hardest by this reality. I would argue that they are far more qualified to discuss what we, as relatively fortunate Americans, are only beginning to understand. Theirs is a message that deserves to be heard. Another common criticism is that the Occupy movement lacks a coherent message or a set of solutions. Uh, I believe Dr. Yutaro will cover this in more depth, uh, so I'll just touch on it briefly and then finish up. What the Occupy movement protests is a globalized system which prioritizes limitless profit over the needs and dignity of human beings. The fact that there's a greater number of me there, there's a great number of messages being put forward is not a weakness. It's a result of the fact that many different people are being screwed by the same system in many different ways. <laughs> you may think that camping out or occupying public space is a strange tactic, but take a good look at what it's saying. It's creating peaceful, civil disobedience to demand that these issues get brought to the forefront of American dialogue. And guess what? It's working. The absurdity is that they're being criticized for not going through the status quo process of the system when what we're trying to say is that the system is broken and doesn't work. The other critical message is that of the global 99%. There's been a realization that it matters how the people around us live. We can't pursue a blind trajectory of individual success if our neighbors, both domestic and global, are unable to get their most basic needs met. Creating a flourishing society and economy requires the investment of human capital. Not for some, but for all. These concepts really aren't that radical. In my opinion, this movement isn't anti-capitalism. It's against a type of capitalism that diminishes people's right to live the kind of life that they have reason to value. Quite honestly, standing up for not only civil and political rights, but social and economic rights is patriotic in its most basic sense. So we can all sit back and criticize the movement. We can find humor in the details while ignoring the bigger picture. But I have a hunch that as young leaders, our energy would be better spent working to create solutions. Instead of mocking the demands of the protesters, I suggest that we take a deeper look at the source of these demands and work with our fellow citizens to find ways to address them. 
That, in a nutshell, is why I participate in the movement. And it's why I support this event as a way to expand the conversation and hopefully involve more people in taking the next step in fixing what's wrong with this country.